Hello and welcome back to Bookish. Today I wanted to talk about how I deal with uh, dead racist authors uh, and their books. This video is inspired by a couple of videos I've been watching uh, lately. Uh, one by Keir over the channel Keir the Scrivener uh, in which um, um, she discussed um, you know really terrible authors and their books uh, and whether or not you know she wanted to keep reading them and she uh, mentioned Flannery O'Connor which um, really her approach and what she said about Flannery O'Connor uh, really is is kind of the thing that jarred me into making this video because I realized that you know a lot of the things that I've said before about reading uh, dead racist authors um, I needed to rethink and uh, and her video definitely challenged that I was also struck by Sarah from Hardcover Hearts in her weekly wrap-up from last week in her kind of discussion of uh, anti-Asian uh, anti racism uh, in Virginia Woolf, uh, which is something I hadn't thought about and something I think that we often uh, overlook uh, as readers here uh, in the United States or maybe in the English-speaking world. And then kind of Greg from Supposedly Fun's ongoing struggle uh, with Margaret Mitchell's um, <laughs> Confederacy apologizing uh, tome Gone with the Wind. All three of those uh, booktubers uh, and their videos kind of inspired me to make this. Now, one of the problems I have as someone talking about and giving you my idea uh, about, you know, how I approach reading uh, dead racist authors is that, you know, as a cisgendered uh, white male uh, in the United States of America, I am quite possibly not the best judge of, of how anyone should react uh, to racism in books written by authors who've been dead for 100 years or for 200 years or for 50 years, and I accept that. And I'm, I'm not putting my ideas out there as an example of what should be done or as what's more right than other people. Uh, this is just a video I wanted to make to kind of, you know, explain how I approach it uh, and maybe just explain it to myself and to force myself to, to kind of look at, at all these kinds of things. So the first thing I want to say is nobody has to read any of these books. I don't, I don't mean that hostily. I, I sincerely believe that you don't have to read Huckleberry Finn if you don't want to. And I support the idea uh, in schools where Huckleberry Finn is a sign that teachers should have an alternative uh, to reading Huckleberry Finn available for their students. Not because I think Huckleberry Finn in its outlook on the world is, you know, terribly racist, but there is racism in the book. Uh, and, and, you know, Mark Twain writing when he was certainly entertained, I think, some ideas that in today's world would be racist and upsetting. And therefore, I think it's perfectly fine that anyone uh, skips Huckleberry Finn or any other author or work uh, which has this reputation for being racist. Uh, it, you know, if those kind of things upset you, then, then you can skip them. We don't all have the same experiences. It's not... You know, for me to say, well, I don't think Huckleberry Finn is racist, well, you know, perhaps that's easier because I have never been the victim of the kind of racism, or any racism for that matter, of the kind of racism that is portrayed in Huckleberry Finn. And it doesn't affect or upset me in the same way uh, it might affect a person of color, an African American person, uh, it's said in the United States. And that goes for any other work, whether it's a work which is uh, reported to be racist or anti Semitic or. Uh, homophobic or misogynist, you know, we all get to choose and, and that's okay. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't judge people for choosing not to read, uh, not to read these books. That I choose to read them is in part because, you know, that's part of the literary tradition I grew up with and in part because I actually have kind of a fascination uh, with kind of debunking some of the uh, myth-making that we have around authors and hi historical figures from the past. Sarah said this great in her video, you know, that one of the things that we need to do as contemporary uh, people is to take the shine off of authors and off of historical figures, to see them not as these kind of perfect people, not as these geniuses whose every word, utterance, writing, action has to be defended, but to accept uh, that they were, in fact, flawed people uh, and oftentimes could be quite uh, racist uh, in, in what they wrote and what they said in their personal lives, and that we don't have to accept that. We can choose to 
or not as we see fit, but to idealize someone to the point where you reflexively defend them. Um, and she was talking about Virginia Woolf here and anti-Asian stereotypes in Woolf's work. To reflexively defend them by saying, oh yes, but you know, they're a genius, maybe, but you know, maybe they're a racist genius. That's entirely possible. So, you know, part of one of the things that, 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 that brings this up for me is are the authors, you know, that I have read. And if you follow my channel, you know that uh, Hemingway and Faulkner and Balzac are, are three authors who I have read extensively and authors whose work uh, I admire. They're also authors who, as people, I am not necessarily admirers of. And one of the things that I think reading them uh, makes you aware of, uh, or, or at least makes me aware of, is exactly how common these racist ideas in the past were, how common the use of racist language was, how common the creation of racially stereotypical characters were. This is true with Balzac in terms of anti-Semitism in his work. And, and by the way, if you don't know, if you're reading a 19th century author from the Western tradition, you are going to find their books filled with anti-Semitic tropes and characters and language. Uh, and it really is, can be very jarring. It's important uh, to, I think, to read those books to see exactly how common uh, racism, anti-Semitism, etc. were in the past. And that's one of the things that I do. But, you know, in addition to that, I will say that I, I think there are great works of literature that contain anti-Semitic uh, language, that contain racist language. Uh, and, you know, I accept that that's true. And again, I choose to read these things. But racism is a perfectly valid reason not to like a work of literature. It's not, you know, acceptable, I think, for me to say, well, yeah, it's a great work of, you know, you can't just discard these great works of literature because of racism. Well, of course you can. That's a perfectly legitimate reason for doing so. Uh, and so, again, I, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. I'm just talking about uh, my approach. So here is uh, my approach. I accept that dead authors whose books were published, let's say, before 1960, are likely to have in their books racist language, misogynist language, anti-Semitic language, anti-Asian language and themes and characters and characterizations. I accept that those things are there. Uh, I choose to read their books because I think there is literary value uh, in those books that might exceed uh, that racism. And the only way I'm going to know that is by reading uh, and finding out. So, you know, this kind of helps me then also by reading these books, it kind of helps me to understand better the time in which they were created um, and the attitudes uh, that were surrounding, swirling around the authors uh, when they wrote these books. So there is kind of, for me, kind of a historical interest in reading these books and kind of detecting uh, the racism, uh, et cetera, in these books because it, it puts me more in mind or it makes me more aware of racism, et cetera, in the past. One of the things also I do, a second kind of a part of my approach is, is I, I look at the book and say, is the racism and bigotry the point? Is that what this book is about? Is the book actually promoting racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism? Uh, is that really what the book is about? It, you know, is that the theme of the book? And this is very rare. And this is one of the things I think, which, you know, allows people who are interested in reading uh, works from the past uh, to go on doing so, because oftentimes what I find in, in my reading is that the racism, the anti-Semitism, etc., isn't the point. That's not the theme. That's not what the book is about. Those things are introduced casually, and as horrible as that is to say, the casual introduction of those things tells us so much about the time, not just about the author, but about the time in which those books were written, that these ideas were in such, in these tropes, in this language, was in such common and wide use that authors included it without even thinking about it, without even reflecting on it. But, you know, obviously, even with a dead author, I'm going to try to avoid reading books that promote racism, that are essentially about racism, saying, look, these people are bad because they're members of this race. Those books are, are incredibly rare. What's more common is finding books that have these kind of uh, casual mentions, casual discussions, casual inclusion of racism. Again, if this, if this, if you, if this really bothers you, this is a good reason not to like those books and not to read them. 
but my approach is that, that those things are can tell me about the time period and the author and take the shine off the past, as Sarah said, and take the shine off some of these uh, authors. So then the, the third part of my approach is that when I'm reading along in a book, and I find a race, a, you know, the N word, I find racism, I find uh, anti Semitic ideas. I ask myself, is that the author speaking or is that language coming from a character? If it's the author speaking, as is common uh, in 19th century, late 19th century uh, books in terms of anti Semitism, uh, you know, then again I go back to the thing I mentioned before is the anti Semitism the point? Uh, if it's the N-word in the work of, of an American author, is the N-word being spoken by a character who the author clearly wants us to dislike? A character who the author clearly feels like is not the hero? And then uh, is the author, in this case I'll just say Faulkner since we just finished Faulkner in August, is the author putting racist language in the mouth of that character so that we dislike that character, so that we know something about that character that's unsavory? so that we don't trust that character. Well, to me, you know, that is actually uh, a use of racist language as a way of characterizing someone as bad or untrustworthy, whatever, uh, that I find uh, to be valid. Probably maybe the best example of this would be uh, Tom Buchanan early in uh, The Great Gatsby in his conversation with Nick. He mentions a book called, I think, The Rise of the Mongrel Races, which is a eugenicist kind of piece of racist crap. And by... Tom promoting that book, we know that Tom uh, is a racist. Uh, and I don't think anybody emerges from Great Gatsby thinking Tom Buchanan is the hero or a great guy. So, you know, I look forward in that way. Is that character then, if the book develops, is the character who has expressed these racist, anti-Semitic, whatever ideas, are they the hero of the book? Do they end up, you know, in the end of the book being the person we're supposed to admire? If they are, then that racism becomes a lot more problematic to me. If they're not, if they're the, the villain, if they are not successful, if even if they are successful, if we're supposed to view them and say, well, yes, they're successful, but they're successful in a bad person, then to me the racism has less of an impact, and the racism is actually a part of understanding why these uh, are, in fact, uh, bad people. So... That's kind of really important, uh, and Kier mentioned this in her video. I thought she, her video did a great job where she said, you know, to her, you know, in the works of uh, Flannery O'Connor, that that wasn't good enough, that, you know, the idea that racist language coming from characters was meant to characterize them as bad, and who was speaking the racist language to her, it matter. I think that's a perfectly valid point, uh, and I, I, I think that's a good reason to, you know, if you feel that way, not to read these books. And then the other thing I noticed, and this isn't so much my approach, it's something that I've observed, and that is that oftentimes books written by dead racists, well, they weren't written when they were dead, but you know what I'm saying, the books of dead racists uh, are actually better than the person, that the races of the person, whether it's Flannery O'Connor or, uh, or William Faulkner or Honoré de Balzac, the racism of the, of the author oftentimes is greater than the racism that appears on the page. I've made this point with Faulkner several times that he is a better, he's better on the page than he was in real life. You know, and you can accept that or you can think, oh, you're just making excuses or whatever. And that's fine, you know, that you get to have that opinion. But I think one of the things that happens uh, with authors like Faulkner is, their, their racism becomes obvious to them when they're writing. When they're writing for an audience they, and they intend their book to be widely read, at least on a subconscious level, most of them think to themselves, wow, that sounds really bad. Is that something I want to have associated with me? And they may not be thinking about that clearly, but they have a tendency, I think, uh, O'Connor and Faulkner have a tendency to avoid, you know, necessarily putting their own ideas about race and racism on the page and instead creating characters who are better than them uh, and creating kind of her heroic narratives around characters who don't share uh, their racist views and their racist ideas. Uh, that's not always true, uh, Margaret Mitchell being a case uh, going the exact opposite of that, but that is one of the things uh, that I think about. So having said that, I will tell you I have double standards. You know, in a personal, you know, list of, of things that, which I use to justify reading uh, works by authors from the past who are dead. You know, uh, 
I'm much more likely to read another book by Balzac or Faulkner or Hemingway, uh, another story by Flannery O'Connor, and more books by Virginia Woolf than I ever am to pick up my very first H.P. Lovecraft. Now, there are a couple reasons for that. A, H.P. Lovecraft is widely known to be a fairly, fairly, to be a virulent racist. I don't think you'd be a fairly virulent racist. You are a virulent racist. Uh, and I have heard that his books contain overtly racist themes. Uh, add to that the fact that I don't really read science fiction and, or horror, and you have the reason why uh, I happily avoid H.P. Lovecraft for being uh, a racist, where I don't invo in, you know, avoid William Faulkner for being a racist. You know, there is uh, kind of a double standard. I think if you think that if, if I'm right about what I believe about H.P. Lovecraft, you can see how I've applied uh, my method, my standards for evaluating uh, the works or reading the works or my approach to reading the works of dead racist authors uh, in my rejection, essentially, of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Anyway, uh, that was kind of confusing and all over the place, but I wanted to make this video because it is something I thought think of as really interesting um, and something that I think is, is, is worth discussing and if for no other reason to emphasize the idea that we all get to decide. You know, it's not up to me to decide what you think is racist. It's not up for me to decide whether or not you think racism is a good enough reason to stop reading or to avoid reading an author or a book. Of course it is. Uh, anyway, there you go. Look forward to your comments in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for watching.